Speaker. I rise again for the 19th time to highlight the epidemic of rape and sexual assault in the military. By the military's own figures, 19,000 sexual assaults and rapes occur each year, but only 13 percent of the members of the military actually report them. Last week, I met with Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta along with my colleagues to discuss DOD's new report of data on rape and sexual assault in the military. The report shows a slight increase in reports of rape and assault, but a startling decrease in the number of charges brought against reported perpetrators. With a decrease in charges came a significant decrease in prosecutions, in punishments, and in convictions. The numbers, frankly, are very discouraging. When I left the meeting, I was only pleased about one thing. Secretary Panetta and I agree that the only way to solve this problem is with an increase in prosecutions. We agree on the result to be achieved, but for the right now, we do not agree on the steps to achieve it. After our meeting, Secretary Panetta announced new initiatives. But DOD's three major proposals will not increase prosecutions, convictions, or punishments. Proposal one, elevate cases of rape and sexual assault to higher ranking officials in the chain of command. Military commanders today told me that uh, many are already having them handled by colonels and captains, yet this does not result in more prosecutions. I believe the cases have to be handled by an impartial office within the military, but outside the chain of command. Proposal number two, establish a special victims unit in each service of the military. These units have been in place in the Army since 2009. I'm impressed with the training program that is offered to the various members of the investigation and prosecution uh, within the Army. But again, we have not seen an increase in prosecutions, convictions, or punishments as of yet. Proposal three, create a centralized database of these proceedings and cases. This is a good thing. It's already required in the Department of Defense as a result of the NDAA 2009. So for all intents and purposes, all of these initiatives are already in place to some extent. What the problem is, is the chain of command. And let me explain. Claudia Castillo, an Army corporal, whose attempts for justice back in 2003 and 2004 were thwarted repeatedly by commanding officers, including a high-ranking lieutenant colonel, all of whom were unmoved by her reports of sexual assault and harassment. Corporal Castillo was on combat deployment in Iraq when she awoke to a fellow specialist on top of her, sexually assaulting her and using force. She was in shock and screamed until he left. She immediately reported the assault to her platoon sergeant, who responded with a lack of surprise or concern. He advised her to wait while he, quote, looked into it, unquote. He did not have any advice for how she could go help, get help or go forward. Corporal Castillo also encountered several incidents of harassment, stalking, and erratic behavior by a much older staff sergeant. She would wake up to find him standing by her bed while she slept. Her reports to command were greeted with ridicule and not taken seriously. Command discretion empowers the commander to decide if a case goes forward to a court-martial. Even if very high-ranking commanders are in charge of these cases, captains and colonels are not shielded from the conflict of interest that exists in the chain of command. Victims should have the benefit of impartiality by objective experts, which is why my bill, H.R. 3435, um, attempts to do that. We need to overhaul the current military justice system. And I will continue to sell, tell stories like Corporal Castillo's until military justice means justice for all. I yield back.